Now, who was here at Easter? Who was at the Easter family service? Great. So lots of you. And you would have been given bulbs if you chose to take them. Yes. yes. The 100-day bulbs that were gladioli. And we promised you that hopefully in 100 days they would flower. And this week we've had lots of pictures come in because lots of them have bloomed. So we've got some pictures here of some absolutely... Don't you wish you planted yours now? <laughs> Stunning colours. And look at Christoph up there. Look, he's willing his to come and flower. But um, apparently he's flowering now, is it, Chris? Yeah. So, yeah, well done to everybody. They are some stunning gladiola. Julian, would you agree? They are stunning specimens. Yeah, Julian approves. Julian, our gardener, approves. Um, yeah, so well done to all of you. And hopefully they will come up every year and it will serve as that reminder about how Jesus changes lives because we asked you to pray for something and to, to dwell on that for 100 days. And actually we've had some lovely feedback from people saying that they wrote prayer requests in their journal and they looked back at um, certain days or the flower appeared on a certain day when they really needed hope. So they've been really a blessing to hopefully lots of you. So thank you for planting them and growing them. And hopefully every year you'll be able to think about um, Jesus when they come up and the beauty of nature and the beauty of God in all of nature. So thanks for the photos and uh, thanks for growing them. Um, I'd like to welcome our very dear friend Steve. Steve is a pastor, a theologian, an author, a preacher and him and his wife Lynn who's down there with him. You will have seen them before and you see them sporadically come through Riverside and Steve helped us with our All One series. They're actually moving to Whitstable which is very exciting. They've been in the throes of that for a while. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Um, but we would just like to welcome both of you, but also Steve, to come up. And uh, he's going to share the word with us today. So let's give him a massive round of applause. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much, Keely. That's it's so lovely to be with you today. Um, my birthday is the 2nd of December. <laughs> If you want to make a, a note of that now, if you're making notes on the sermon, 2nd of December. <laughs> so today we're going to be continuing the new sermon series that Simon kicked off last week. If you missed his talk, then it, it was really good. You want to catch up on YouTube, definitely make sure you don't miss that. So I'm going to talk about what I reckon is Jesus' third most famous parable, the one in the bronze medal position. <laughs> so the most famous parable has to be the Good Samaritan, followed by the prodigal son. If only because just about everybody has heard of them and they're almost like catchphrases, aren't they? So I reckon the parable of the sower comes in at number three. We can maybe talk later about whether I'm doing a disservice to the lost sheep or the sheep and the goats, whether I'm being a bit sheepist or a bit sheep phobic or something like that. But we can talk about that later. Now, something you may not know is that there's a connection between the parable of the sower and the BBC, and it's not songs of praise. The BBC is the British Broadcasting Corporation, and the connection is that middle word, broadcasting. So before we had TV and radio, broadcasting was just a farming term, and it meant scattering seeds instead of planting them one by one. Here's a nice uh, biblical looking picture of a farmer sowing seeds by broadcasting them. And you can see the uh, bag of seeds around his waist and he's spreading them everywhere all over the place. So you can probably see why that word broadcasting became the word that they use for spreading TV and radio transmissions all over the country in the same kind of way. So we find the parable of the sower in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're the ones that we call the synoptic Gospels because they're written in a similar kind of style and they have many of the same stories in them. So we could read it from any of them, but I'm going to go with Luke and we'll draw on Matthew a little bit as well. So Luke chapter 8 and verse 5. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. 
Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When Jesus said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Let's just uh, pause it there for a moment. So as Simon was explaining last week, but this is really important, so it's worth repeating this week as well. A parable is a made-up story featuring stereotypical characters and placings and settings that people would be familiar with from everyday life. It's a little bit like the way in which we might use a, a TV drama or a movie for a sermon illustration. And the thing about a parable is that it had two levels of meaning. One was the kind of obvious things in the story, what was happening on the surface. So in this case, that would be the farmer and the seeds and the soil and so on. But the truth that a parable was teaching was never to do with the features on the surface. And it's really important that we grasp that. The point of a parable was a second or deeper meaning that was not visible on the surface. And the idea was that people would uh, think about it and talk about it and maybe argue about it and try and figure it out together. So neither the characters nor the events nor the settings are ever part of the truth that a parable is teaching. So the parable of the bridesmaids isn't telling us that statistically half of all bridesmaids are stupid (laughs) or that bridegrooms are always late. And maybe more seriously, the parable of Abraham, Lazarus and the rich man isn't trying to teach us anything about heaven and hell. That parable is just set in Hades, which is not hell in the evangelical sense. It's simply the place of the dead, where everyone at the time thought that dead people went as a kind of waiting room for the afterlife. So the truth that that parable was teaching is that how we treat people in this life has eternal consequences. So those surface ingredients are never the teaching, directly or indirectly. Any more than if a preacher used the imagery of St Peter standing on a cloud at the pearly gates with a a clipboard in his hand to see if our name is on the list. Now, most of the time, when Jesus told a parable, he wouldn't say what the parable's deeper meaning was. But sometimes he did, and this time he does. Or he sort of does. Let's um, have a look at it. He gives them a, like a starter for ten. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Okay, so there are three characters in this parable. The sower, the seed, and the soil. Three S's, if you like. Sower, seed, soil, a bit of a tongue twister. So to start with, we need to know who they are and what they represent. Who's the sower, what's the seed, and what's the soil? So let's start with the sower. And and this is kind of the easy-peasy one. The sower is obviously God. So is that God the Father, God the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes. Whenever one of the Trinity is identified as doing something, theologically speaking, all three persons are always present and involved because they are one. One heart, one mind, one nature and character and one agenda. 
So we don't need to be too fussy about who's doing what. Now, ideally, of course, we don't pray, thank you, Father, for dying on the cross for me. But apart from that kind of thing, we don't need to be too picky. The Father sows seed, the Son sows seed, and the Holy Spirit sows seed. And that seed is something that Jesus calls the Word of God. Now, you may be thinking, I've heard this parable so many times before. It's all about people who aren't Christians hearing the gospel and the reasons that they do or don't accept Jesus, depending on whether they are good or bad soil. So hurry up and finish the talk, Steve, and we can all get home for lunch. (laughs) But what if I said the parable can certainly include that, but it means a whole lot more than that? Because it's talking just as much to those of us who are already Christians as those who aren't. So let's start with what the seed isn't, what that word of God isn't. It's not the Bible. We call it the word of God, but the Bible actually never calls itself that. And it isn't the gospel or at least not in the stripped-down sense of the four spiritual laws or the Romans' road or the sinner's prayer. And if you've never heard of any of those, then don't worry about it. You haven't missed anything. None of them is this word either. We see what the word is, what that seed is, if we look at Matthew's version of the parable, where Jesus says it's the word of the kingdom. Or in the NIV, the message about the kingdom. Which is that the rule and reign of God has arrived in this world in the person of Jesus. The coming of God's kingdom has begun. Just like when Aslan arrives in Narnia and the power of the white witch begins to go into reverse. The curse is broken, the snow and the ice begin to melt where until now it's been permanently winter, but never Christmas. When Jesus begins his ministry in Matthew's gospel, his gospel is not those four spiritual laws or the Romans road or the sinner's prayer. It's something called the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. His message wasn't, would you like to pray a prayer to give your heart to Jesus so you can go to heaven if you die tonight? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but the good news of this gospel of the kingdom is way bigger than that. The gospel of the kingdom is what life begins to look like when God is restored as king when we see the presence of God and the power of God transforming people's lives and situations in all kinds of ways, material as well as spiritual. When the enemies of human life and human well-being are in retreat, when the damage that's been done by Satan and sin and sickness and suffering is being healed and restored. And the kingdom comes in me I have said yes to the gospel when I bring my life in line with that Jesus kingdom agenda, when I personally become part of Jesus' mission. At the start of Jesus' ministry in Luke's gospel, he says the same thing in a slightly different way. And this time it's in Jesus' first sermon in the synagogue at Nazareth. First mentions in the scripture can be significant at times. They can set the scene or the agenda for what then follows. And that's what's happening here in both Matthew's gospel and Luke. We're seeing Jesus' mission statement. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place, Isaiah 61, where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, 
because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. These are the reasons the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus. And they're also the reasons that the Holy Spirit anoints us. It's not just to give us spiritual experiences or make us feel closer to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with those things, nothing wrong with spiritual experiences or feeling closer to Jesus, but they are not the product. They are byproducts. The Holy Spirit anoints us to spread good news by being good news. In a kind of Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done in people's lives kind of way. Starting now in this life, just as Jesus did. He didn't wait until heaven to start transforming people's lives, so nor should we. Now one interesting thing in this parable, uh, I don't know if you noticed it when we were reading it, but it's how often Jesus repeats hear or hearing or heard. At the end of the parable in verse 8, Jesus calls out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Or as the message says, are you listening to this? Or in my paraphrase, hello, are you hearing me? And Jesus is not asking whether we heard the word of the kingdom and responded sometime in the past. He's asking whether we are hearing the word of the kingdom and responding to it in the present. Now, I'm sure many of us can remember when we heard the gospel and became a Christian. But that's not the word that Jesus is asking if we're hearing this is not a parable about becoming a Christian. It's a parable about being a Christian. Whether we are keeping on hearing and keeping on responding. Whether we are bringing our lives more and more in tune with the kingdom. More and more aligned with the kingdom. With who kingdom people are and what kingdom people do. So the gospel of the kingdom isn't just, would you like to go to a lovely spiritual place called heaven when you die? The gospel of the kingdom is, would you like to be part of a community of God's people that's bringing a foretaste of the future into people's lives starting now, just as Jesus did in his ministry? So that's the seed. What about the soil? And, of course, there are four different types in the parable, four different kinds. We have the path, the rocky ground, the thorny ground, and the good soil. So one good kind and three not-so-good kinds. And the first thing we need to realise is that Jesus isn't comparing here good people and bad people, or Christians and non-Christians. The soils are how all of us respond to the seeds, to the word of the kingdom that Jesus speaks to us. Which is not just a, a one time, have you or haven't you, did you or didn't you pray the prayer kind of thing. Because Jesus is always asking us questions. He's always inviting us and encouraging us to keep on hearing that word of the kingdom and to keep on saying yes to it. To speak to that person, to love that person, to bless that person, to pray for that person, to serve people, to give our time, our money, our hospitality, to open our homes and so on. And this parable is encouraging us about the blessings that come when we respond to that word as good soil. And it's warning us about the things that can cause us to not respond as good soil. Warning us that if we're not careful, we can end up responding as one of those not good kinds of soil, rather than as the 
good soil that I'm sure we would all want to be. Interestingly, in only one of those three not good kinds of soil does Satan get a name check. But they correspond to our enemies in the Christian life, the so-called unholy trinity of the world, the flesh and the devil. So the enemy in the first kind of soil, the path, is Satan. But we can't just blame him for everything and say, the devil made me do it. The problem with the path and the reason why the birds in the parable are able to take away the seed in the first place is because the path is hard. And of course, the path being hard is a metaphor for hearts being hard. There's more than one reason that our hearts can become hard, of course, and they're not always our fault. Maybe our experiences in life have been so bad that we've had to harden our hearts to protect us from being hurt more. Maybe, as the parable suggests, it's because we've been trodden on so often by so many people that we're just worn down. We used to be like the good soil, but life has changed that for us. Or maybe we've become hard towards God because we feel that God has been hard towards us. In the parable of the talents, which we should really call the parable of the bags of gold, as the NIV puts it, because a, a talent wasn't an ability, but a sum of money. In, in that parable, the servant buries his bag of gold, and the reason he does that is because he said to the master, I knew you to be a hard man, so I was afraid of you. Maybe we think of God the Father as a hard man, as an angry God, a hard-to-please God, a nitpicking, fault-finding kind of God who might just break out against us and punish us at any moment. So we're afraid of him. We've become hard towards him. Maybe because our own father was like that. The problem with the rocky ground is not that there's no good soil there. The problem is that there isn't enough of it. There are too many rocks there as well that haven't been cleared away. So the good soil is too shallow for the roots to go down as deep as they need to to survive. So we get blown away this way and that way when troubles come because that little plant of faith in our life isn't mature enough to get through it. As soon as we hit problems and difficulties in life, we drift away from God because we kind of blame him. We assume that he doesn't love us or maybe that he isn't real because if he was and he did, then he wouldn't let these bad things happen, we assume. It feels like God has let us down on his side of a deal, which was, I become a Christian, and then all these lovely promises in the Bible will all come true for me. We kind of forget that, maybe because we never knew, that Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. But then in the very same verse, John 16, 33, he also said, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And what Jesus was saying here is that it's kind of both and. Both those things will be true at the same time. So he's saying, hang in there, guys, and trust me when trouble comes. Trust that I'm with you and I will always be with you in everything that you go through. And the problem with the thorny ground is that it's competition. The kingdom of God in our life is having to compete with the kingdom of this world in our life. And sometimes the kingdom of this world is winning. It's not winning in the sense that we're not a Christian, but it's winning in the sense that when we're faced with competing choices, the kingdom is the one that gets squeezed out we kind of give in to that competition. We give in to what Jesus in the parable calls life's worries, 
riches and pleasures. Now, for most of us as Christians, most of the time, the thorns, as it were, are not the really big things like stealing or murder or adultery. They're the subtle ones like being mean and self-centred and greedy. Things that could creep up on us and we don't realise. And nowadays I would suggest that a really big thorn that our parents and grandparents maybe weren't faced with in the same kind of way is what A.W. Tozer called the great God entertainment. So it isn't that we're not in the kingdom at all. The problem is that not all of the kingdom is in us. It's not that we're not committed to the kingdom, it's that other things are also on the list, and sometimes they creep higher up. So when God scatters the seed of the kingdom in our direction, we, we hear those seeds, but we don't always respond to them. We choose other things first. We allow other things to win out. And entertainment and leisure and enjoyment, for enjoyment's sake, are really big temptations for us today because we have so much there to choose from. Now, please don't understand me on this point because God most certainly wants us to enjoy life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And there's nothing wrong with that. Tozer himself agreed with that. But he said it's all out devotion to entertainment as something that we live for. That is something else. That's the problem. The abuse of a harmless thing, he said, is sin. And then finally, there's the good soil. Soft hearts for the kingdom. Hearts where the message of the kingdom is taking root and producing great fruit. Because ultimately, fruit is what matters. Because a Christian is not someone who believes the right things. I mean, the devil believes all the right things. What matters is the fruit of believing the right things. The fruit is what tells us whether we are believing the right things. Because if we are, then the fruit is going to reflect that. And if you do a word search in Matthew's Gospel on BibleGateway.com, you'll see what I mean. Just search for fruit. And at the end of the parable, Jesus promises that if we let that word take root, it will produce fruit up to a hundred times what was sown. And the normal crop that a farmer would hope for in those days was ten times. So Jesus is saying if we allow our hearts to be good soil, if we allow the kingdom to take root, if we get rid of the rocks, if we get rid of the weeds, if we hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us and we respond to it, then that power of God will be able to do ten times more in us and through us than we could ever imagine. And at the end of the parable, the good soil is the people who don't just hear the word, but retain it. That's in the NIV. Other versions say it's the people who hold on to it, who cling to it. And the Greek word there means in the same kind of way that a policeman would grab hold of a criminal and not let go. So let me leave you with one final thought. Why is that sower so reckless with the seed? Why scatter it? everywhere like that. Why not just scatter it on the good soil? Because you would certainly think that a God who knows everyone's hearts would only bother sowing seeds on the good soil. He wouldn't waste it on people who are hard like a path or people who've got rocks in their lives or weeds in their lives. But he does. He's extravagant and generous he scatters his love everywhere, indiscriminately. 
And of course, he wants us to be like him, like that farmer. He wants us to be doing the same towards other people. Would that all Christians would scatter God's love indiscriminately to everyone like that. And I know we're not talking about the parable of the prodigal son this morning, but that word prodigal means recklessly extravagant. So it's really the parable of the prodigal father. Because just like the son was recklessly extravagant to a point of foolishness with his money, so too the father was recklessly extravagant to a point of foolishness with his love and his welcome and his forgiveness. And he didn't care how it looked. Just like Simon said last week, that shepherd didn't care how foolish it looked to leave behind 99 to go to look for one. The point of scattering seeds like Jesus scatters seeds is that they will go all over the place because they're supposed to. Because God never gives up on any kind of soil. He never gives up on any kind of person. So neither should we. Maybe the worship team could uh, come and join me. Thank you. (coughs) In that prodigal son parable, the son is being pictured as the epitome of the least deserving person that anyone could imagine. And so too in this parable. No soil is unworthy of the message of the kingdom being generously scattered over it. God scatters forgiveness all over the place. He scatters his love and his acceptance and his welcome all over the place. If we want to be disciples of Jesus not just believers or followers, then we too are all called to generously and even recklessly scatter kingdom seeds for Jesus all over the place, wherever we can, on whoever we can. And it's not our job as Christians to assess the soil. Our job is to put all the energy that we've got into scattering those seeds of the kingdom everywhere and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Just that beautiful imagery of, the, of God scattering. And I just had that sense again that he's, you know, there's a, two, there's a two-way thing going on here today. He's scattering his word afresh into your heart. I'm sure we've all, we all resonate with those different kinds of soil. We're a, we're a mixture, aren't we? We're like a a mixture of those elements of soil within us. Um, and I felt the Lord wanted to, um, to really kind of scatter his word over you again today. He scatter his, his words of life and love and encouragement and faith. Because maybe for whatever reason, the word of God has, has not produced that crop, produced that fruit. And then from that, that beautiful exchange where we can then go and basically scatter love extravagantly over other people, not expecting something in return, not judging who's worthy to receive that love, but just being indiscriminate and extravagant with the way we generously show God's love to people. So let's just wait on the Lord for a moment before the band starts. Let's just offer him our hearts again. Lord, we want you to come and we want you to Scatter your love over us again. Scatter your word over us. Speak to us, Lord. We also, God, know that you are symbolically represented as the gardener as well. So we know you're able to come and landscape our hearts this morning. You're able to come and help us deal with the hard places, the pressed down places. You're able to deal with the, the rocky places and identify the things that are choking the fruitfulness of your kingdom in our lives. So we want to submit to your spirit again today. Come and do the work in us, Lord. Come and do the work in us, Jesus. We welcome your spirit. So as the band just play, let's just allow the spirit to work in our hearts, that image of the gardener. 
coming and just tending the garden of our hearts. If you want someone to pray with you, you can either ask someone close by, a friend, or you can come to the front and get one of the team to pray for you. But we're just going to spend the last five minutes or so just really allowing the Spirit to work in our lives. So try not to think ahead. Try not to think about lunch or coffee or what's coming next. Try and just give this time to God. Allow Him to work in your heart by His Spirit.